dark, ghostly, and historic. Edinburgh is a city bursting with life as much as it has narrow alleyways. Kings, queens, gravediggers and grey fires Bobby have all called the city their home. Built around an extinct volcano known as Arthur's Seat, Edinburgh is most certainly one of the most impressive capital cities in the world. The city is beaming with a lively atmosphere all year round, with its fancy shops, delightful restaurants and ancient history attracting tourists from all over the world. From Winter Wonderland in the winter, and the Edinburgh Fringe in the summer. This city makes billions of pounds from tourism alone, being the second most visited city in Britain behind London. But how did Edinburgh reach this milestone? How did it manage to become a hub for tourists and students alike? Hello everyone, I am Lewis and welcome on here to the first episode in this brand new series titled World Explained. Due to this being the first episode, let me give an overview to one of the most interesting series to land on my YouTube channel. World Explained is here to present information you didn't know about particular places, events, nature, famous sites and much more. The purpose of this series is to enlighten everyone, including myself, on how to insert Finn here came to be. To begin this series, I thought I'd start with a place pretty close to my heart. Being born in and growing up near Edinburgh, I thought this was the perfect city to introduce World Explained to everyone. Edinburgh will be explained through a two-part documentary. This part will feature the introduction of the city from the Romans to the English invading, to Scotland having their own monarchy and having to fight for their independence. There will also be mentions of the creation of Edinburgh Castle, Edinburgh University and how the plague affected the city. The next part will then tackle how Edinburgh became the modern city seen now, how the new town was designed, how Birkenhair and Greyfriars Bobby got embedded into the historical value of the city and why the Edinburgh Festival is one of the most successful annual events to take place anywhere. With all that being said, let's take an in-depth look at how Edinburgh started. Centuries ago, during the early Middle Ages, Edinburgh, Scotland and Britain completely different. The nation was split into kingdoms. Northwest Highlands, the Scottish Isles and Grampian Mountains being in the north and the central lowlands and southern uplands holding up the south. The earliest known habitation in the Edinburgh area was at Cramond, where evidence was found of a Mesolithic camp site dated to 8500 BC. Yes, that long ago. Before we discuss Edinburgh, Let's dive into details on how Scotland was handling situations during the early Middle Ages. Around 60 to 61 AD, Burica was the queen of the Celtic Brits. She was brave. She was fierce. She was relentless. How can a lady lead during those times, you may ask? Well, usually if you are strong in Scotland, gender is out of the window. Burica proved her resilience and led an uprising against the incoming Roman Empire. At this time, Scotland is made up of many Caledonian tribes. These tribes would speak Celtic languages and are often described as being red-haired or big-limbed, being at the forefront of a Scottish stereotype. Well, these tribes obviously didn't have the methods of the day for hearing major news. They would have to eavesdrop and speak to other tribes to find out the latest gossip and ongoings around the country. This meant that they wouldn't have heard much about the work the Roman Empire were doing and taking over the world, literally, until they hit their territory in the attempt to advance their borders upwards after rising above most of England. However, their quick acceleration up north didn't frighten the Caledonian tribes, who should off listen to their head rather than their egos. They decided that if the Romans wanted a fight, 
fight was what they were going to get. On their path to victory, the Romans managed to halt Bruticus Uprising, who died after a shocking failure and was said to have poisoned herself. So much for never giving up, right? Well, the Roman Empire was led by Governor Julius Agricola, who sent a fleet to survey and map Scotland's coast in 79 AD. By 83 AD, Agricola had conquered Britain right up to southern Scotland. The Caledonian tribes had no choice but to fight back now. According to Atacitus, a Roman historian and son-in-law to Agricola, the Caledonians turned to armed resistance on a large scale. These tribes mainly used the tactic of guerrilla warfare, which, if you don't know, is sneaky tactics such as ambushes, raids, hit and run, or just petty violence. These often work when you have no hope in a straight up encounter. Which was exactly the case here. The Romans were trained in military attack. They would wipe out the tribes in the masses if the battles were head on, which is why guerrilla tactics worked to perfection for the Caledonians. If it means survival, why not use it? In one surprise night attack, the Caledonians nearly wiped out the whole 9th Legion with guerrilla warfare. It was only saved when Agricola's cavalry rode to the rescue. Even though these tactics were resulting in success, by the summer of 84 AD, Agricola and his legions had pushed deep into the Caledonian homelands in the northeast of Scotland. It was during this time that something went fatally wrong for the Caledonians. Up the Grampian Mountains, at a place recorded as Mons Gropius, the Caledonians foolishly decided to face the Romans at a head-on attack. Hopes were rising for these tribes due to the success of their previous tactics and having numbers on their side. However, even with 30,000 men, this decision was certainly seen as an error. The experience and dominance from the Roman Empire in a head-on battle was conveyed through this devastating bloodbath, which resulted in 10,000 men being slaughtered in a battle which could have easily been avoided. As well as those who fought valiantly to the bitter end, many fled into the surrounding forests and mountains, burning their houses and killing their own wives and children in fear of Roman reprisals. Tactus describes this as, the hills were deserted, houses smoking in the distance, and our scouts did not meet a soul. Following their defeat at the Battle of Mons Gropius, the Caledonian tribes must have considered that their days were numbered, but then luck intervened. The Emperor Domitian ordered Agricola back to Rome to help resolve the more pressing military crisis on the Rhine and Danube frontiers. By 306 AD, united and better organised, the Emperor Constantius Chlorus was forced to protect his northern frontier against Pictish attacks on Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall was a border created by the Roman Empire to separate their side and the enemies. This wall was between Tyne and Solway. The Picts, if you don't know, are the tribes north of the wall, based on her name for the Caledonians. Eventually, the tides were turning against the mighty Roman Empire. As Rome weakened, the Picts became bolder, until in 360 AD, together with the Gaels from Ireland, like a circle, they launched a coordinated invasion across Hadrian's Wall. The Emperor Julian dispatched legions to deal with them, but to little lasting effect. The Pictish raids cut into the south deeper than ever before. Finally, the Roman system of law and order broke down and the wall itself was gradually abandoned. And in 411 AD, the Roman legions kindly left British shores to deal with the barbarian crisis at the heart of the empire. The first main stories happening in Edinburgh are recorded to be around the 1st century. Romans managed to find their way to what is known today as Lovian, where they found a Britonic Celtic tribe. This tribe was called the Votadini. The Votadini transitioned into the Gododdin Kingdom in the early Middle Ages, with Eden serving as one of the kingdom's districts. During this period, the Castle Rock site, where Edinburgh Castle sits today, is thought to have been the stronghold of Din Eden. The medieval poem Why Good Odin describes a warband from across the Britonic world who gathered Din Eden before a fateful raid. This may describe a historical event around 600 AD. The stanzas that make up the poem are a series of elegies for warriors who fell in battle against vastly superior numbers. 
Some of the verses refer to the entire host and others eulogize individual heroes. They tell how the ruler of the Gododin, I am not going to be able to pronounce this correctly, but let's me try, Min Dog Moon Four gathered warriors from several Brythonic kingdoms and provided them with a year's feasting and drinking mead in his halls at Den Eden before launching a campaign in which almost all of them were killed fighting against overwhelming odds. Let me read out a few stanzas of the poem. Why Gododin for you? Gododin, I make claim on thy behalf in the presence of the fron boldly in the court. Since the gentle one, the wall of battle was slain. Since the earth covered anorin, poetry is now parted from the Gododin. And might a man, a youth, in years of boisterous valour, swift, long-manned steeds, under the thigh of a handsome youth, quicker to a field of blood than to a wedding, quicker to the raven's feast than to a burial, a beloved friend was Wayne. It is wrong that he is beneath a cairn. It is a sad wonder to me in what land Maro's only son was slain. Men went to Catriath at morn. Their high spirits lessened their lifespan. They drank mead, gold and sweet and snaring. For a year the minstrels were merry. Read their swords, let the blades remain. Uncleansed white shields and four sided spearheads before me and dog men for's men your scent berries tart lilac sweet to dream of raven locks and twisted stormy of violet eyes glistening In 638 AD, the Gododin stronghold was besieged by, a f by forces loyal to King Oswald of Northumbria, and around this time control of Lothian passed to the Angles. Their influence continued for the next three centuries, until around 950 AD, when during the reign of Indulf, son of Constantine II, the borough, a fortress, was named in the 10th century. Pictish Chronicle as, as Opidum, Eden, was abandoned to the Scots. Scotland finally had control of the territory which will become Edinburgh. Shortly before, I mentioned Edinburgh Castle was atop of Castle Rock. This was a highly effective place to build a castle. One, it was high, giving the Scottish army and monarchy advantage in noticing enemies entering the city, along with a great view of what was probably mainly farmland, and two, it was difficult to get to for those enemies. However, the castle wasn't built in its entirety at the same time. It took time, and by time, I mean centuries for it to be completed. Firstly, the oldest building in the castle and in Edinburgh is the small St Margaret's Chapel. This was constructed during the 12th century, and is actually one of the few remaining buildings from that era. It dates from the reign of King David I, who was in power from 1124 to 1153. David wanted to build as a private chapel for the royal family and dedicated it to his mother, St Margaret of Scotland, who died in the castle in 1093. Currently, this chapel is actually being hired out for wedding ceremonies. This castle is at the forefront of Edinburgh history, outlasting the wars of independence, World War II and everything in between. This castle will remain one of Scotland's biggest landmarks throughout the whole country. Actually, let's discuss how the Scottish Wars of Independence affected the city. It was a dark, brutal era for the whole of Britain, which is Scotland and big, mighty England. Who was supposed to inherit off of this? England was so powerful, and King Edward I believed he could take over the country of Scots once Alexander III died at Kinhorn in 1286. With no clear claim to the throne and Edward's sly personality, he managed to get the Scots into a position to place him in the role of overlord, which eventually led to him becoming King of Scotland. Obviously, you would have heard of the deadly battles that took place throughout this war. There's the Battle of Stirling Bridge, there's the Battle of Bannockburn, and there's also William Wallace and Robert the Bruce, which is a few events and people that come to mind during this timeline. But, 
you might not know how it affected the capital city of Edinburgh itself. Very early in the war, March 1296, England had full control of Edinburgh Castle, their height of 430 feet being a metaphor to their power over the Scottish nation and most of the world. Following a siege of three days and many bloody deaths, Edward had many of the Scottish legal records and royal treasures moved from the castle to England and a large garrison of 325 men was installed in 1300. After the death of Edward I in 1307 however, England's control over Scotland weakened. On the 14th of March 1314, a surprise night attack by Thomas Randall, first Earl of Moray, recaptured the castle. Finally, Scotland had possession of Edinburgh Castle once more, which hopefully they celebrated in all of its glory that night as it wasn't the last time they would have to fight over the stone fortress. After the death of Robert the Bruce in 1329, Edward III, King of England, wanted to get redemption for his grandfather and be the king Edward II was not. Honestly guys, Edward II was a rubbish king, just don't follow in his footsteps. Honestly, what a loser. Anyways, he tried to get on the Balliol clan's good books by stating preferences over Edward Balliol being king of Scotland rather than young David II, Bruce's son. Edward invaded in 1333, marking the start of the Second War of Scottish Independence, and the English forces reoccupied and re-fortified Edinburgh Castle in 1335, holding it until 1341. This time, the Scottish assault was led by William Douglas, Lord of Liddensdale. Douglas's party disguised themselves as merchants from Leith, bringing supplies to the garrison. Driving a cart into the entrance, they halted it there to prevent the gates closing. A large force hidden nearby rushed to join them and the castle was retaken. The hundred Englishmen of the garrison were all killed. After many scraps over the castle, it looked like the Wars of Independence was coming to a close. The Treaty of Berwick was declared in 1357 and things looked to get a bit more peaceful in the city. This gave King David II time to get to work on rebuilding the battled war damage remains and making the fortress fit for a king. Obviously, like a superhero, he worked on a tower named after himself, starting construction on David's tower around 1367. However, unfortunately this tower was left incomplete because he died in the castle in 1371. Luckily, his successor, King Robert II of Scotland was a nice little guy to complete the work and get the tower fully built. Today, this tower is hidden behind the Half Moon Battery and was most remarkable for hiding the crown jewels in World War I. As you see, Edinburgh Castle is a symbol for the capital city, it's one of the most historic buildings and being so high can be seen from almost anywhere in the central part of the borough. It truly is a magnificent castle and even has a 1 o'clock gun at, you guessed it, 1pm every day to signal towards ships out at Leaf and Forth. However, it isn't the only spectacle in the city itself. Edinburgh in the 15th century was a booming town. It had one of three supreme courts in the country in 1458. Trinity College Kirk and Hospital were founded in 1460 and many markets opened its doors such as Webster's, Wright's and Mason's. Also, 1485 marked the first time stone tenements entered the city as these buildings started to be made around the Leaf area. Then, in the early 16th century, work was done to build Holyrood Palace, an official place of residence for the monarchy and still currently used by Queen Elizabeth whenever she visits the Scottish castle. Did you know that Holyrood Palace is believed to have the ghost of bald Agnes Samson haunting its halls? She was stripped and tortured in 1592 after being accused of witchcraft. Jeez! Anyways, if you think that was bad, Holyrood Palace also got burnt down in 1544 with the whole city on fire. Wait a sec. Yes, it is true. On the 7th of May 1544, Henry VIII of England attacked Edinburgh in a vicious attack of arson. Some backstory. King Henry wanted the kingdoms of Scotland and England to reunite again. He had a contract with the Regent Arryn that Mary, Queen of Scots, would marry his son, Prince Edward. But Arryn allowed the Parliament of Scotland to revoke this agreement, prompting Henry to declare war in December 1543. And now the Regent was making ground against his rebels who still supported the English marriage, such as the Earl of Lennox, Earl of Glencairn and the Earl of Cassillis and the Earl of Angus. These nobles were in touch with Henry VIII via Lennox's 
secretary Thomas Bishop and the Angus's chaplain, Master John Penvin. Their letters to Henry VIII requested intervention and in March he replied that a main army was in preparation. Henry's Privy Council issued his instructions for the invasion force on 10th of April 1544 and they were to put all to fire and sword, burn Edinburgh, so raised and defaced when you have sacked and gotten what you can of it, as there may remain forever a perpetual memory of the vengeance of God lightened upon them for their falsehood and disloyalty. He managed to complete this task, burning down houses, villages, farmland, castles such as Craig Miller. Leaf is estimated to have lost a value of £10,000 due to the stock of linen cloth and other items being turned to ashes, which back in those days it was a ton of money and in my eyes still is. This was a dark day in Edinburgh history, however in hindsight they didn't particularly dwindle the success of the city and still managed to rightfully defend Edinburgh Castle. They weren't again threatened by war and even though rebuilding was a long tiring process, at the end of the war in September 1551 and February 1552, Parliament laid down guidelines for sharing the burden of costs for rebuilding the burnt lands and tenements. They said, Brent be the old enemies of England. After this, Edinburgh went on to have an increase in population. St Giles Churchyard reached full capacity of the dead in 1562 and Queen Mary had to grant use of the grounds of the Greyfire Cemetery. Also, the city started to become steadily more academic in 1582, with the University of Edinburgh being founded. This would be the fourth university in Scotland and began by only teaching law. So I guess Edinburgh expected a boom in lawyers that decade? Famous names coming from this incredible university would be Sir Walter Scott, we will be discussing him in part 2, Charles Darwin, Alexander Graham Bell, Robert Louis Stevenson and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Now let's just jump in on a century, we can do that in World Explained. Edinburgh was a thriving city with hundreds of merchants and money coming in from shipments of ported goods. However, Edinburgh's old town is narrow, it's easy to be crowded and due to the unsanitary rat infested era, Edinburgh was hit with the bubonic plague epidemic in 1645. The plague, easily identified as the Black Death, was a vastly spread virus which gave the host a fever, groins, pains, cramps and could easily travel between person to person. It's estimated that at least half the population died from this disease. The virus collapsed the economy, ships would stop sailing and businesses would have to close. Corpses dotted the city like lampposts. That may be an under exaggeration. Authorities demanded that everyone with the infection were to live in quarantined huts outside the city walls so it was clear who was healthy who was ill. Plague doctors entered the city to try and test cures, but this was a painful task and patients died with or without treatment. Burial pits had to be created to make room for the dead as cemeteries just couldn't cope. Due to the date we are speaking of, an exact death toll wasn't recorded but 3,000 people only died alone. Edinburgh at this time had a population of approximately 35,000. Edinburgh hadn't been hit with such a crisis and massacre until then and now you guys should understand the reason why we should stay inside our homes during these uncertain times of coronavirus. We don't want to see plague doctors and pointy masks walking around Edinburgh again. Finally, in 1707, an Act of Union was passed through Parliament uniting the Kingdoms of Scotland and England. This was done to help aid the Scottish economy which was hurt from the Nine Years' War from 1688 to 1697 and the War of the Spanish Succession in 1701. Although not one petition in favour of Union was received by Parliament, on the day the treaty was signed, the Carolinar in St Giles Cathedral rang the bells in the tune, Why Should I Be So Sad? On My Wedding Day. And there you go! Edinburgh in the early ages, as you can clearly see, has dealt with many wars. Death has flooded the streets. We haven't even got a new town yet! But merchants and businesses have become more prominent and Edinburgh was the most financial city in Scotland at the time. If you decide to visit Edinburgh, check out the places mentioned in this video. Edinburgh Castle is fantastic for anyone interested in history like I am. Also, the National Museum of Scotland holds a whole section on early history of the first people to roam the lands of the brave. If you did enjoy this video and learn something new as I learned loads creating it, then drop a like. Comment if you have ever been to Edinburgh before and subscribe so you don't miss the second episode to drop in next week. In said episode, 
I will discuss the industrial boom that takes place across the capital, along with buildings such as the Scots Monument being constructed. You will also hear the stories of Greyfires Bobby and Burke and Hare during a pretty spooky time for the country, or at least how I perceive the Victorian era. Lastly, I will mention how the Edinburgh Festival has become the great annual event that it is today. But for now, goodbye, and that was Edinburgh Explained. Well, the Roman Empire was led by Governor... Sa... Sa... N n no, n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n n